I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. And I am so excited about this panel because I got to make this panel. <laughs> I don't get to make much around here. I get to cheer, I get to organize, I get to try to get the non-caffeinated bubbly water in the stand too. Um, but these are four nonprofit executives who have vision, who have heart, who are leading massive organizations that are responsible for serving the public in all sorts of complementary ways. Uh, each one of them has to corral the assets of iconic institutions that we all know, uh, maybe we've donated to them, maybe we've worked through them, maybe we've received their publications, maybe we have family members that have worked for them, and they're complex, and our world is changing, and they need to both drive change and adapt to change. Um, and you know, every now and then we, we lionize you know, these corporate titans that lead these complex businesses, but these businesses that are serving the public good are every bit as important and maybe in some ways even more complex to lead in these times. This is a really great uh, audience. There's a lot of people here who have a lot of interest in the missions of your organization. So thank you all for being here. Um, as an opening question, just to get into it fast, I will ask each of our panelists uh, to, to just sort of say, what is your organization and what is its reach? Um, and again, to each one of you, thank you for traveling out to Aspen. Great. Thank you. I'm Jill Tiefenthaler, and I'm the CEO of the National Geographic Society. Um, our reach, it, our mission is to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world, and we do that through funding lots of grants and lots of programs. We call them explorers who are on the ground all over the world, about 6,000 of them globally um, in, a, in um, over 100 countries, 140 countries. And we also, of course, have a lot of reach through our media partnership, where we have um, a, a partnership with Disney. You may have seen our tile on Disney+, Plus, where we get those explorers um, into and our nature videos out to many more people, as well as many of you when I tell people I'm from National Geographic, they talk to me about the magazine in their parents' attics or wherever they are right now. Uh -huh. Hopefully you're still reading them digitally. Um, but also our social media channel is the largest organization in the world. We have more than followers than the Kardashians. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she should drop the bike. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't necessarily aspire to have that many, no, but, but, yeah. but hi, I'm Angela Williams. I'm the president and CEO of United Way Worldwide. Our mission is to mobilize the caring power of communities. We are a 135-year-old organization. We have 1,100 local United Ways operating in 37 countries. Here in the United States, we cover about 95% of uh, communities in the U.S. What I love about our organization, sorry? Oh. Uh, what I love about our organization is that not only do we have 14,000 staff that are living and working in communities, but we have 1.4 million volunteers mm -hmm. that want to get engaged in making a difference. I'd like to say we're a community action network. We focus on health, education, economic mobility, and the environment, disaster relief. But we are one of those organizations that we partner with anyone and all. So for those of you that want to make a difference in your community, call us. We would love to work with you. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Starsky. After this, I should say first that I'm a United Way alum, so I, I, <laughs> I'm an Angela fan. Um, my name is Starsky Wilson. I'm blessed to serve as the president and CEO of the Children's Defense Fund. Um, our mission uh, is to build community so young people grow up with dignity, hope, and joy. Uh, we do that work uh, in 11 offices across the country, uh, and we do it uh, in the brilliance of our founder, Marion Wright Edelman, uh, pulling the three-legged stool of social change, of direct service programs, including a network of CDF Freedom Schools, providing culturally relevant pedagogy as a literacy intervention for young people in 200 sites across uh, the country, including uh, Harambe's that are going on right now uh, all over uh, the summer. Uh, and leadership development, uh, where there are college students who are running those programs for 16,000 young people and their families this summer. Uh, we also engage in uh, multi-issue public policy work, 
um, there in Washington, D.C., in the Beltway, uh, where we seek to impact through federal legislation the largest, most diverse generation of American history. In American history, there's 74 million people uh, who don't have a vote unless you give them yours. So we try to encourage you to do that uh, through advocacy work uh, and building on big issues, like um, trying to make sure that we can sustain something like uh, a, a sustainable child allowance, like the expanded child tax credit that we had for one year mm -hmm. and other English-speaking developed nations have permanently uh, in order to lift children out of poverty and also make sure that we reduce the disparate contact with child welfare systems. And then finally, we do targeted community organizing. For 30 years, um, CDF has been following uh, Dr. Edelman's wisdom that you've never had a movement without young folk, women, and church folk. <laughs> Amen. So we've been Amen. building deep, <laughs> building deep uh, at Alex Haley Farm in Clinton, Tennessee, trying to bring those communities together uh, to build for the world that we need for tomorrow, for these young people, and to build the context and power to make this policy agenda possible. Monica. So, I'm Monica Medina, and uh, I'm an alum of National Geographic, and I'm a college classmate of Dan Brunel, <laughs> so I am on this panel, I think, by very uh, good luck, and um, I'm currently... And incredible leadership. <laughs> okay. Yes. Absolutely. I'm currently the president and CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society. If you live in New York City, you know us as the Bronx Zoo, the Queens Zoo, the Prospect Park Zoo, and the Central Park Zoo, and the New York Aquarium, but we also have a giant footprint around the world. We operate in more than 50 countries. The, um, and our mission is to conserve wildlife and biodiversity and nature, wild places all over the world. We are um, in a, uh, at a planetary crisis now. We're in a biodiversity crisis. We're losing wild places faster than we have in the past. Um, and it's, it's a, as urgent a, a crisis as the climate crisis, but we also have the regenerative power of nature to help us. So in our work, in these 50 countries, we are managing or helping to uh, protect over 50% of the current biodiversity that exists on the planet, and the size of the areas that we work in is the size of North America, and 90% of our programs are community or indigenous-led. So we are trying to do the work on the ground. We're the largest on-the-ground conservation organization in the world, in addition to having the wonderful zoos and the aquarium in New York where we educate more than a million school students, school students, uh, uh, New York City stu students a year, and we have 3.5 million visitors uh, to our parks where we hope that we can inspire people to want to be the, the ones uh, protecting and conserving wildlife and wild places. Whew, my first question is just <laughs> to say thank you. It's amazing, the four of you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is so awesome to be together. And there is a lot of responsibility that comes with stewarding an iconic institution that generations of people have invested themselves in. That's a special responsibility. Um, it complements the work in the world. So maybe I will start with Angela and just ask you, but then we'll ask each of you to reflect. Um, what does it mean for you to lead an organization of this size, reach, meaning, impact, and tradition? What it means to me, first, let me share personally, I am living my best life. <laughs> 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 and the reason I say that is I have always been a, per a person of purpose and mission, and I'm really clear about my responsibility while I'm alive on this earth and it's to serve others and to make sure that others have the ability to live their best lives too and to thrive. And so when I think about leadership in what, uh, I know a lot of you have heard this term, a VUCA world, have you heard that? We're living in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world where we see things happening moment by moment that change people's lives, whether it's gunfire or violence, school violence, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's other natural disasters, whether it's a war, um, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's inflation. People are just trying to live and, to, and to, to make it. And so with our organization, uh, United Way Worldwide, as I said, we're 135 years old, but the, the notion is how do we, we used to be called a community chest, how do we collect the, the goodwill and the assets in the community, bring it all together, and help those in need? Yeah. 
And so fundamentally, these issues that we're facing around the world, the language may be different, the culture, the faces may be different, but when it, when it comes to food, uh, hunger, nut good nutrition, education, um, just trying to have economic mobility, whatever the issue is around the communities, we have the obligation to work together and to partner together. So as I lead this organization, and that's why I said I want to collaborate public-private partnerships with everyone on my panel. Now, these are my new best friends. They don't know it yet. <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to do things in order to make a difference. And so in a complex society, in a complex um, uh, organization that I have. There's a lot of strategy, a lot of levers to pull, behind the scenes thinking, and then connecting to figure out how do we move things forward. So I hear partnership, I hear service and impact, and I yes. hear trust. Um, and all of that it, it was accrued to the United Way, uh, and you then had the chance to steward yes. this organization. And I'm going to get to change in the next question. Um, but let's go to Starsky. Uh, Children's Defense Fund, another iconic institution. You're the only the second leader of the mm -hmm. institution. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so say a little bit about um, how you think about tradition, purpose, uh, and the organization's um, history. Yeah, I, I think about it in the context of that uh, kind of African symbol and concept of Sankofa. Uh, what is the responsibility? So the, the picture of the Indigra symbol is a bird that is facing forward and looking backward. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a call to reflection that in order to move forward, we have to look back at where we've been. Uh, and it literally means go back and get it. Mm -hmm. And so I think about um, the touch points in my own life that have been served by the Children's Defense Fund in order to advance uh, the future. I, I recognize that in the 1990s when the Children's Defense Fund was starting something called the Black Community Crusade for Children to respond to community violence in urban neighborhoods and to respond to high teenage pregnancy rates and failed uh, education programs uh, and begin to plant through movement things like the Harlem Children's Zone and the network of CDF Freedom Schools. These are the same issues that I was dealing with in high school. CDF didn't know me, but it yeah. saw me. Mm -hmm. And so I have to recognize that. I have to think about these historic touch points. CDF was founded in 1973. Um, Jim Lawson, who has a little bit of credibility in this civil rights thing, uh, locates the contemporary civil rights movement from 1953 to 1973, and it transitioned leadership in 2020, which means CDF was born at the edge of the civil rights movement and transitioned in the midst of the largest uh, mobilization for racial justice since then in the midst of the George Floyd protests. That has to mean something for my leadership. Uh, for what this transition means. I, I believe that the transcendent and the universe work together to give us some signs yes. when we don't have the answers. Yes. And so part of this for me means discerning vocation individually, but also institutionally. So at CDF, yes, we talk about mission, vision, values, but we also talk about institutional vocation. What are we called to do? in this moment, and part of my responsibility is to call that question in the context of our board, to call that question with our staff, to call that question in community with young people, and to model out what it means to be faithful to the question without having definitive answers. The great challenge for me in being only the second leader is that our values have walked among us, and we have had a touch point in one of America's greatest prophets in, Amer in Marion Ray Edelman, with us every day. Without those, we've got to do the work to discern the essence of the journey, to articulate what these values will be and must be for a third generation of America's children and listen to them and have them to tell us what is faithful to do in this moment. So a lot of my work um, is frustrating people <laughs> by not giving them answers. That's right but rather seeking to facilitate processes whereby we might be faithful to the questions and discern the future yeah. together. Now, that is tough for folks mm -hmm. who are used to clarity, who are used to certainty, even when the certainty is wrong, That's right. who are used to things that they are used to, mm -hmm. even when they've been outmoded for some time. <laughs> but this is what the rising generation of young people need from us yeah to be faithful to them. And so I, I remember at all times that there are young people that I will never see that I must serve. And they will figure out perhaps 20 years from now that CDF in this moment 
saw their experience and was responding to it, even though we didn't see them in the same way I did. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Monica, your organization is 120 years old or so. Um, so you're stepping into uh, an incredibly important cultural institution that's evolved over 120 years, not the same as when it started for sure. How do you think about your responsibilities to its tradition, its heritage, um, and its role in the world? Uh, thank you, and it is an honor to be on this panel with so so many uh, inspiring leaders. I will say, for me, uh, this job, it, I am the first female to hold this job, so I look at it probably different than every person who sat in my seat before me just because of that. And I'm grateful to the board for actually giving a woman a chance to run this organization. And we are a hundred and almost 25 years old, and and one of the things that we've done over time is had 500 million people walk through our zoos in New York. That's a huge impact. And yet, we know that what we need to do is inspire young people to continue to want to help conserve the planet. We do this work not just because of nature and how wonderful it is, which is easy to appreciate when you are here in Aspen, but because it's important to people, we depend on nature and biodiversity. There, um, one of the uh, panelists last night, the CEO of Patagonia, said, there's no economy without a healthy, clean environment. We rely on things like clean air and clean water and uh, soils and everything that is part of the natural world. So we have a really big obligation to continue to try to put much of the world under conservation. What scientists tell us is that 30% of the planet needs to be conserved in one way or another. By 2030 is the goal that uh, the global community has set for itself. There was a big international meeting last December. All the countries of the world agreed we want to try to save 30% of the planet by 2030. So that's our mission. That's what inspires us. That's what that's our purpose, uh, and, and I think it is important to give young people hope that we can actually do that. So that's where our zoos and aquarium come in. Yep. Thank you, Monica. Um, Jill, Nat Geo, yes. <laughs> uh, how do you think about the legacy that you have walked into and are extending? Um, and maybe let's get you thinking but for the rest of the panelists about change, too. Mm -hmm. So we're also 135 years old. I think you're one year older, so, um, <laughs> and have been around a long time. And our history um, is fraught, to be very honest with you. So if we go back and think about National Geographic 135 years ago, there's a, it's, some of it is amazing, and people see this yellow border, and people tell me these wonderful stories, but there's also a serious history of, uh, colonialism, of extraction, of exploitation, of racism and sexism. So also as the first woman to sit in the seat um, in 135 years. I think a big thing that um, we're trying to do at National Geographic is to reckon with that history and to reclaim exploration in a new way. Um, so I, we're thinking a lot about, part of that is who are the explorers? You know, in the old days we would think our explorers were the white North American guy who went out to discover things around the world. And we're really trying to move away from parachute science and parachute storytelling. And really now 50% of our new explorers are women and 65% of our explorers are non-American who are working in their home regions around the world. So um, we're, and when you see these young people in a room together from all over the world, we just had our Explorers Festival um, last week, it is so dynamic and exciting. So we want to change the story, we're going to change the storyteller, um, and um, that's a big part of where we're going. We're also sort of reckoning with our past by thinking about this amazing history. So our archives, are incredible, as you can probably imagine, from all over the world. And 98% of them have never been seen by the public. Just those few little bits have gotten into the magazine. Um, but we want to actually open that up to source communities and make it not the extractive and exploitive thing that it was in the past. 
So we've started to do that. We had one of our first amazing projects with an explorer named Yazan Kapti, who is Palestinian American, and he went in and took 60 years of Palestinian um, history in our archives of photographs and put them up on social media and asked the diaspora of Palestinians to recaption the photographs. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredibly powerful topic, um, exercise, and then in the end, we st they started to identify these nameless people who were in National Geographic. Wow. That was my great grandmother, and we gave names to, yeah. to folks. So that's where we're looking to the history. How do we move forward in a different way, but also reckon with that past and try to make right some of the hurt we caused in our own past? So, um, so inspiring. And as you've furthered that work, have you felt any pushback or resistance? Oh, none. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hard because we, you know, when you open up space for new people, yeah. that means it's more crowded, right? And so not everybody get, um, is, gets the same privilege that they have in the past. Um, and meaning changing the storyteller means not everybody's getting the same um, yeah. amount of coverage that everyone's had and, and et cetera. So um, we also started this amazing new program, which I'm really proud of, called Africa Refocused in South Africa. And it is a uh, project to train black Africans to make wildlife documentaries in Africa. So everything from the best cameras to underwater scuba diving to um, African composers um, composing the music for wildlife filmmaking. Um, and that's a lot of resources that is going to a project and people who used to make those um, are still a part of that, but inclusion, you know, sometimes means, doesn't mean pushing other people out, but it does mean making room, right? right? Especially in the resources. So I would say there's always pushback, but there's also incredible excitement, I yep. think. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Angela, tell us about change at United Way, and if any of the changes that you're helping to lead with your team um, are encountering headwinds that you have to think about. So one approach that um, I've had and started talking about is that we need to be partners and not saviors when we're working in community. And so when I think about that, when we have these conversations about needs in communities or with individuals, we have to start with inviting to the table the people who are actually, actually living in that space. Uh, that have the lived experiences, and as my friend Claire Babineau Fontenot, the CEO of Feeding America says, have the lived expertise. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that because in being in the room with them and having them come up with what would be the solution to what I live with on a daily basis is the mode in which we need to operate in this philanthropy, nonprofit, uh, even CSG, CS, I mean ESG, CSR space, and that is the listening part and uh, collectively working together. But at, from an organizational standpoint, we're what's called a federated organization, which means that all 1,100 local United Ways have their own CEO, their own boards of directors. And it's, it's in the corporate space, it's almost like a franchise. So when you want to actually, but we're, but we're a system. And so a lot of funders and a lot of people see United Way and it's one system. So how do we begin to get my local CEOs to start thinking from a we perspective instead of a me perspective? How can we use this system in a way that has transformation systematically because we are a system? How do I begin to think about capacity building for our system in a way that we can affect change when we think about clean energy or just uh, community sustainability? Um, there are things that we can do because we are in these communities that no other organization or system can do. So I'm thinking from a systems level and a global network level all the way down to a, a small rural community or the United Way on the Nav Navajo Nation and thinking how do we start knitting this together to really have impact. Because again, you look at 2030 or you look at other um, stark data and the reality, we have to mobilize and we have to act now and we have to do it together. So, so this a I, sense so, of yeah, urgency. Exactly, and you have this, this idea of knitting and mobilizing and connecting all these different assets and mm -hmm. parts. It is quite inspiring to say it, but there's a lot of day-to-day -day oh, grunt work to do it. <laughs> 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 like that's really assigning yourself 
quite a challenge. So uh, my team asked, can we replicate you? And I don't want anybody taking my DNA replicating me. I think uh, the world is no. not <laughs> like that. <laughs> my husband certainly wouldn't. But <laughs> what I think is, is important is how do I empower others around me yeah. to, to do the work? And how do we have these sessions where we see the end goal and declare even what is the critical number? It may not be 100%. It may be 30% of the willing that are willing to come alongside and start doing the work together, then that's where I can see things happening. I think about movements. I think about the civil rights movement. My dad was very active in that. And just, you know, it's the young people and, and people thinking we can do this, then things begin to happen. I'll think about um, Greta, um, what's her name? Uh, yes, yeah. another example, a young woman who just kept at it. So I am a huge believer in networks. I'm a huge believer in movements. And I'm a huge believer in the power of one person who sparks and ignites the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, so when I stepped into this role that I'm in at the Aspen Institute, more than a few people said to me, I really so feel sorry for you following <laughs> Walter Isaacson. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I didn't have an answer for a while, but now my answer is, well, at least I'm not Starsky Wilson following. Fair. Fair. So... Uh, uh, change. You're early still in your work. Um, uh, I hear a lot when you describe uh, the purpose of the organization and your way of engaging the young, those that will be seen by the organization as renewing and extending. Is there anything at the moment you feel comfortable talking with this group about that needs to change? Yeah. Um, <laughs> narrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, first and foremost, I mean, I alluded to this a little bit before, like culture. Um, um, we have been an organization that has centered around a powerful central figure, mm -hmm. decentralizing, building, uh, I'm, I'm clergy, so I use these different metaphors, uh, building for movement and not empire yeah. mm -hmm. um, is appropriate in the context of our story and our DNA. Centralized authority, no matter who's at the center, is a characteristic of empire. But our roots and story, which began in many ways uh, inspired by, with even Miriam being inspired in Mississippi Freedom Summer, is more faithful. And so we've got to wrestle. We are indeed an institution in this moment. Uh, but changing and shifting toward a culture of decentralized authority, I believe, is more powerful in this moment. I, I slipped that yeah. in. I didn't know if I could use dirty words. Um, uh. Power is important. Yeah. The two things I've done structurally to shift the organization since I got there, the first thing I did, first 90 days, was dust it off, reinvigorated our 501c4. Yeah. Um, we needed, in a moment where the moral suasion and the attempt to shame America for allowing its children to live in poverty has failed mm -hmm. because we seem to have no shame about this fact. Mm -hmm. We actually need to be able to wield power in order to advance the policy we need. Yep. And this has not been something we've been using or talking about in the same way. We need powerful people who will stand up for children and we need to, we need to leverage our own power to do that. Mm -hmm. The second thing I did was reinstituted uh, and restructured and stood up a leadership development and organizing unit. Uh, we had been doing this work kind of off the side of the desk, the, the, the back end of things, uh, not saying, yes, if you need women and young people in faith communities, then you need people who get paid every day to, to build power among them, to build capacity with them. And so this was a critical part of the work we had to do as well, uh, which is a change for us, building a new unit, protecting it within the organization, making sure that it's structured so that it can get to its outcomes when people don't know what it is, making sure you do some education around that so people don't make it what they want it to be, not what you actually needed it to be when you started the thing in the first place. Um, these things are really important, but then there were also structural changes that were required for operations and governance. Uh, which are tougher and more risky things to do. Um, you know, for most of my life, this is my fourth four time around being a CEO in some setting, uh, primarily because I'm, I've been bivocational most of my career. So I report to boards. Yeah. When boards need to change and you're the CEO, yeah. 
you are risking your livelihood. <laughs> um, y'all laugh. I had a seven-year-old baby girl at home. <laughs> I, I moved from St. Louis yeah. where I had a good job uh, to Washington, D.C., where the cost of living is higher <laughs> to do this work with my four yeah. children and, and my wife. And, and that um, putting an appropriate and faithful structure around governance, respecting not just what governance has been, but what governance is to be and how it is evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Where governance is not the seat of power, mm -hmm. but rather the board are the hosts of power. Yeah. With responsibility to community and accountability to be connected in those ways. And, and shifting that is the hardest dance any CEO will do. And um, these are my dancing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that the Harvard Business School uh, does a case study of what these organizations are doing because there really isn't enough thinking in society about what it takes to lead and manage and govern and get the resources mm -hmm. for these extraordinary people-serving, community-serving, purpose-driven places. So Monica, you're new in your role and it may be too early even to talk about <laughs> the change agenda, um, but I predict that when you were in the interview process, they were probably asking you or hinting to you, um, what are some of the kinds of changes you might like to see come about? Are there any you care to talk about today? Sure, and I will hearken back to my time at National Geographic because it was instructive and it really helped me, I think, get this job. We need to tell the stories that, of the work that we're doing because we need to inspire people to believe in the regenerative power of nature and, and our need for holding on to the natural world so that we can continue to pass it on to future generations. And what we haven't done very well but I hope to change, is uh, tell our stories, is really help to inspire people using the great science that we have out in the field to you know, inspire them through um, real rational uh, projects and, pr and, and prospects, and also through that wonder of nature. You know, at National Geographic, they talked a lot about the balancing the worry and the wonder. And I mean, we are related to the climate crisis. If we solve the biodiversity crisis, we go a long way to solving the climate crisis. We cannot solve the climate crisis unless we conserve uh, that 30% of the planet. It's 30% of the climate solution. So we need to get that story out there, and I think that's really a, a, a goal of mine in this job, something I hope that we can do a better job of. Well, it's going to be great for the organization as you do it, and thank you. So I'm going to stay with Monica, and um, now, that, now the questions are off the script, so a little oh. tiny bit of a curveball, but um, <laughs> we, don't, we don't get this opportunity to be with leaders like this every day. Um, so Monica was a student body president at Georgetown University about 40 years ago when, uh, when, when I voted for her. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny. You, you think about people that were leaders at an early age, they, and there's these crux experiences that we sometimes have that then inform so much of what we do, how we carry ourselves in the world. Um, one thing I remember about Monica's tenure was that she was the first person I heard, the first student I heard, talk about the importance of Georgetown University and other Division I uh, athletic schools sponsoring and providing Division I women's soccer. This was 1982 or something, 1981. You're just like, oh, how, do you, how do you remember that? Because it was absolutely out of the box. Mm -hmm. And of course now, who would think we wouldn't have that? Who would ever imagine that we never did have that or something? So, uh, you know, leaders are, are sometimes uh, prophets not seen in their own country. Um, well, uh, in this case, I guess I'd ask to start with Monica. Is there an early experience, um, I'm, you know, not, not like the last job, but an early experience you had, a crux moment, a, a, a moment when you had to make a, ch a call or a choice, and that call helped to set your trajectory of leadership. Gosh, uh, I think um, back to those days, Dan, in college, and I, I wanted to stop for a minute and say I had a great campaign man manager in my husband, Ron Klain. <laughs> 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 so it was a little bit, I was very lucky, but we had an yeah, incredible... He had an easier job getting you elected, too. <laughs> <laughs> Although we did have a fake election. We had to do a whole do-over oh, election. Do you yeah, remember? Yeah, no. Anyway, <laughs> college. Yeah. But I will say, 
two things. First of all, it was an incredible class. We had an incredible group of young people in that class. We had another um, classmate who was Pulitzer Prize winning journalist at the Washington Post, Mary Jordan. Um, and I could go on and on. We, we really were, I think, lucky to be pulled together by the you know, grace of Father Healy or whatever it was, the gods brought us together. I think back to the inspiration I got from being in Washington, D.C. at a time when government was really respected. And it was really interesting. We went from the Carter administration to the Reagan administration. There was a, a big change in our country. And, and it was a really interesting time to want to serve in government. I also had the interesting uh, opportunity to be one of the first women back in ROTC at Georgetown. I was Army ROTC in college. That's how I paid for school. And that gave me the opportunity to get a kind of leadership training that not many women got. And I will tell you, I went back to the Army, uh, to the Pentagon, many, many years later as an um, aide to Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, and we helped to open up every single job to women. But before that, many, many, many jobs, all of infantry, was closed to women strictly because of their gender. No other reason. And Secretary Panetta made the very courageous decision to open every job to women in the military. And that has uh, stayed the case today. And, and it's something I'm incredibly proud of. And it started with my time at Georgetown, my time in ROTC, and being surrounded by incredible people like you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, let's stay with this theme, early learning experiences. Before you were the Angela Williams. So, or Angela Williams. <laughs> <laughs> that works, you know. But, <laughs> um, so I will um, take off from what you said. I was Air Force ROTC. Were you really? Uh huh. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I served on active duty for six and a half years. Um, the Air Force allowed me to go straight to law school mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. I, I could then come on active duty as an Air Force JAG. But I grew up on military basis because my dad was the fifth black chaplain in the history of the U.S. Navy. Wow. And yeah. he joined um, in the 1960s. So it's, it's this, this notion of what being one and only in the first has always been my part of my story. But the military, just being able to engage in a different way in the discipline that happened. But I'll tell you two life lessons, um, and my husband reminds me of these all the time. One, as a leader, uh, and as just a person who works with others, um, I need to lead thinking about character and not competence. And, and, and so I'd come home and talk about things. He's like, Angela, you need to think about the people that you work with, how, what is their character? And lead with character um, as opposed to hiring the best person that has the resume. So the character versus competence. The second thing that, uh, or the third thing I would say that has been a part of my learning process has been to um, not be the lawyer in the room <laughs> um, and I had to get a coach for this. <laughs> I did, I said, the executive coach. So, you know, to learn how to just be present, to allow other people to wrestle with things, even though I think I have the answer and I just want to go ahead and act on it, but to sit in the moment and be present. Yeah. So, yeah. It's such an important reminder how the military in American life has been a force of driving social change and often on the forefront of change mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. Now, so Jill and I have been friends since 2011. We were both new college presidents and I used to call her when she was at Colorado College and ask for advice about some of the different challenges I was facing. I never let on I was facing challenges. <laughs> How would you deal with the sit-in? <laughs> I have a friend who wants to. So it's fun for me, knowing you this way, to then think about uh, young Jill and something formative early in your life. So I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and we worked hard, and it was a family farm, and that was formative to everything. Because not only was it a farm, but it was... I always tell people the little town near us was about 500 people, and at least 100 of those 500 were teeth and toddlers. So it was a very strong, um, both sides of the family. I knew all my great, all my grandparents, a ton of, uh, most, most of my great grandparents, cousins, you name it. And so I think that formed a lot of my leadership style. And part of that is being able to, I think, uh, feel comfortable in a lot of different spaces. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, people working on the farm, you know, there were also no 
girls and boys jobs. Um, I had an older sister and me, and we did it all. So my father never sort of um, made choices that way, which was really important, I think, in my own uh, leadership as a woman. And also, I just felt like I was one of those people always kind of had to be very instinctual, listening and learning and, and kind of you know, figuring out how to move around me with this huge clan of people. And I think one of the skills I brought that has really helped me with the leadership in addition to being really a hard worker and is very being very in tune to the people around me and being a listener and sort of being able to figure out who really wants to say something but isn't and drawing them out or who disagrees with me even when they're not speaking. So um, that sort of sixth sense I think I developed somehow in that background has been really helpful. Thank you. Yep. And Starsky, you so appreciate the power of the young to, to drive change and to lead the, we who are older, to be the mentors to those who are older. Um, an early experience for you that set you on this course? Yeah, probably a few. I tend to speak of not events, but kind of experiential containers. So, so the historic black church uh, tradition really kind of shaped and nurtured me uh, much more as a sociological institution than a theological framework. Um, and so I think about their experiencing um, volunteerism. Uh, and uh, we didn't have, I was a youth pastor early in my career. Um, we didn't have youth pastors, no such professionalization. We had somebody's mama who, who like <laughs> pulled the other mamas together to take care of us. And so um, that kind of spirit of volunteerism I saw early as a part of my life. I saw it in my mother, Ella Mae Wilson, uh, who went on to be one of the leaders of the Citizens Committee to Save Our Children and work with, because uh, she was a Southwestern Bell employee, she worked with kind of the Bell pioneers and uh, to work and these different kind of American Business Women's Association, all these things she came to do, I got a sense of uh, what it meant to serve, uh, to volunteer and to organize around that. And so that institution teaching volunteerism also joins the network of synagogues, congregations, and mosques where we experience not just volunteerism, but also experience art. Uh, and creative expression on a more regular basis than even when we go into our museums from stained glass to the choir and the chorus. So again, uh, b being shaped by those elements of the institution uh, have been critical for me and helped me uh, in other tough moments. Um, so when uh, my brother was killed when I was in, when, uh, when I was in high school, and so um, that um, mass murder, the experience thereof, uh, and the care that came around me in those moments from people that I had served among and that I had served uh, came to be formative for me for what it means to thrive and survive through tough moments. Uh, and that is the thing that called forth to me. Uh, I met you in another tough moment when I was yeah. learning from young people in the midst of the Ferguson uprising, yeah. um, because kind of seeing that image uh, from that, um, that case for my brother I connected with again when I saw Michael Brown, and it sent me to the same place yeah. uh, of connecting in community with young people yeah. who transformed my life and my perspective. And so those are kind of the containers and experiences that I think have shaped me most. The Aspen Institute has to start a memoir series, Great American Leaders. We got the first four books, so <laughs> sign up the contracts. Uh, there's so much more to learn and to hear. Um, let me open it up to this audience. A lot of people serving human beings here. On the far right, Hello, this is Soktia Pai, the um, YMCA staff from the Community Development YMCA of Greater Long Beach. Um, and I am also a um, grad student at Antioch University, majoring in nonprofit management. All right. So, well, Ms. Jill, first of all, how do you pronounce your last name? Tiffenthaler. Tiffenthaler, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Jill's good. Ms. <laughs> Tiffenthaler. Um, Everyone might have heard Henry Golding, the crazy rich Asian movie actor who worked with Geo National Geographic, right? And I'm just crazy poor Cambodian, not that one, but we'll be the next one. Anyway, I just want to thank you um, to the, uh, as a student majoring in nonprofit management, I just wrote an essay um, on the, uh, an expository essay around the um, trends of challenge opportunity um, and an and issue that nonprofit sector has been facing. Yeah. Um, I got a good score and I chose um, the issue around uh, changing in donor behavior. And the opportunity that I argue is around uh, creating a subsidi subsidiary, uh, around creating a social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial yeah. in nonprofit. 
and the other opportunity is around collaboration. So now I am in a session with a remarkable nonprofit and corporate uh, sector leaders. So this is good to, to learn more about this, to learn more about the trends of challenges that nonprofits has been facing. By the way, uh, I just texted uh, Ms. Uh, Suzanne McCormick, my national YMCA of the USA CEO, who was the president and the CEO of the United Way. Mm. So and I was hopefully the general just... counsel of the YMCA. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes, small world. I just texted her. So thank you. Let thank me, you. Let me um, maybe ask one of the, we'll just take one, one answer for the question so we can get more questions. Anybody want to comment on social entrepreneurship in your work? Gosh, it's so important for us. Um, where we work, we can't rely on philanthropic um, donations forever to keep these wild places wild. We have to figure out how to build economies, sustainable economies around them. And that's really actually, if I had a second big challenge, that's it. That's it. A plus. Um, let's see, right here is Monique Miles, uh, who leads our work on Opportunity Youth at the Aspen Institute. Mm -hmm. This conversation is deeply edifying, so thank you. So um, I, I feel this question is for all of you, but Angela, you also spoke to this very specifically, and Starsky, I felt like it was baked into your comments as well. The nonprofit sector generally was born out of this idea of charity, and you talked about this shift to proximate leadership as part of how we continue to push this agenda on equity, justice, et cetera. However, given the sort of uh, foundations of the sector, it's fair to say that philanthropy, how we measure outcomes, even the stories we tell, haven't quite caught up to this moment. Can you say more about how you manage that as leaders, not just within your organization, but pushing for the sector to catch up with moving from saviorism to being very justice-oriented? Great I'll question. give you just one quick example. Uh, we are partnering with the Institute for the Future, and we, uh, I, I am so concerned about the next generation of leadership. So we're creating a whole curriculum and cohort um, to train next-gen leaders in the sector, but from a future-focused perspective. So we are training the younger generation of leaders now to look 10, 30 years out at what do we need to do in the sector to lead the sector and to be more relevant. So that's just an example. Uh, and so that proximate leadership means that it's not necessarily the same people, but it's a much more diverse group. Thank you. Let's go to Devin Coleman, who's with the Gates Foundation. Thanks, Dan. Um, so as someone who is 13 years out of Georgetown University, 2012, <laughs> um, and thinking about leadership and the roles that you all occupy, I have somehow managed to fall into some high-stress jobs that are often the most fulfilling and exciting um, in political space, in the tech sector, in education, classroom, on boots on the ground kind of work. How do you renew yourselves and your souls mm -hmm. and your spirits as you do this day in and day out? What are your tips and tricks? Yeah. So I am um, I'm an inner city kid who's becoming a suburban dad. <laughs> it's probably the most stressful confession I have. <laughs> um, that said, um, time with, you know, I have four children, um, so time with my kids um, uh, in different one-on-one -on -one time with each of them is absolutely renewing for me. Uh, and the collective time with my older three or boys uh, is putting around in the backyard now. So, uh, so that's the suburban dad stuff. So like laying sod, raking rocks, um, <laughs> trying, tr trying to get to a green lawn, um, are really are re renewing practices because uh, it's gotten to the point where now, you know, I fly to work as much as I drive to work. Yeah. So when I'm home, I need to be, I need to center down. How good and so is that? I center down with my family. As thank well. you, thank you, Starsky. Jim. Angela, a question on, on governance, if you will. As head of United Way worldwide, how do you, I don't know if it's exercise authority or influence all the local authorities. I, what is your, is it just influence? Is there any authority over how many local boards and, and CEOs do you have? How do you manage to let's say, influence and, and have the, the overall United Way policies and everything adopted by the local 
organizations. So one thing I instituted, thank you for the question, is uh, the notion of a thriving United Way. And so what we've done is gone out, we've talked to all of our leaders in the network and saying, what are the categories that define a thriving United Way? We've done that. We are now putting um, subcategories under that and KPIs. And so what I've thought uh, created is this notion of network citizenship. So I want to leap with influence, but I also want us as a network to sit at the table and define how do we want to show up collectively, and then we have a mechanism through our board where we can then begin to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are going to create not just a memoir series, but a whole school for nonprofit <laughs> education with this group. I want to call out a celebrity who's in the crowd, David Shub, who is the new CEO of the Children's Museum in New York City. Congratulations on your big position. Yeah. And this is Ayanna Thompson on the far right, who's one of our greatest moderators. You get the last question, but it's got to be a quick one because we're almost at time. She's also a distinguished professor at Arizona State uh, and an extraordinary uh, Shakespearean. Man, you're a great hype man. <laughs> this was a fantastic panel. Um, I was hoping one or maybe two, if you're very fast, can talk about culture change. Because I, I understand yeah. you know, when you have the vision and how to implement. But winning hearts and minds can take a long time. So I wondered if you had strategies for you know, to speed things up or uh, what your best practices Can are. Can I just for? jump in quickly? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm doing that now. We're working with Daryl Connor and we're actually, we've created a culture uh, task force of local leaders and we are defining, we've, we've created the vision or the strategic intent of what are we going to be as an organization. We then are creating the, what is the culture that we need to, to support that strategic intent. And then we're going to start the process of, en of enrolling um, all of our leaders, all of our boards, all of our staff around 37 countries. And I recognize that this is 30, several years out. What we're, I also am getting ready to hire for um, a strategic intent resource officer who will help me. So if anybody knows anybody, uh, I desperately need to hire that person because when you think about the culture transformation and implementing significant change, it's a process and you need the tools and resources to do it. Jill, can I give you the last word? Yeah, I would it's the hardest work. And you know that old saying that uh, strategy, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch is certainly true. And I would say one of the tricks I you know learned is um, sustained leadership is important. When people move on quickly, you see things you know, unravel more quickly. And the other key thing is I really think about that those layers of leadership below and how they're living the culture and are empowered to live the culture and brought into those conversations. Because it has to start at top, but it can't stop there. Um, otherwise, it'll end there too, right? Yep. Yeah, Jill, Angela, Starsky, Monica, thank you for your work and your presence. Thank you. Great panel. Thank you. Thank you.